If you would, stand with me as we sing Launch Out. Launch out into the deep, launch out into the deep, launch out to reach lost souls Christ died to keep, launch out into the deep, launch out into the deep, the wheat are white for harvest now, launch out and let us reap. We'd like to go ahead and be seated if you would. We'd like to welcome you tonight. I I think we got a lot of the home crowd, except we have a few visitors with us. We're glad to have you. And uh, just a word up, the pastor has the MRI showed no bones broken, but he suffered a torn ligament, they suspect. So he is home, and we're glad of that. And uh, with that, I'm going to have um, a word of prayer. We'll open our service, and uh, we'll proceed. Heavenly Father, we're so gracious and thankful tonight that we were offered that privilege to be in your house. Lord, we know that in many places and many countries, that's not the case. Father, as we sing and lift your name and praise, we ask that you would be with each and every heart present tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And Kathy's going to come give you our announcements. Okay, we'll just kind of go over the same announcements we heard this morning. Uh, of course, we're welcoming our guest pastor, Pastor Ken and Gloria King, our, our beloved Pastor Dan's parents. So we, uh, we're grateful to have you here this morning, and we're going to uh, be glad to have you here this evening as well. Uh, Faith Promise cards, a reminder to be sure and get your cards filled out and put them either in the uh, offering plates that are around the uh, sanctuary or in the box in the back. Uh, ladies' dinner coming up March 10th um, at the Parsonage. We'll bring a dish to share. Also, men's breakfast is coming up on Saturday the 19th, 8 o'clock, and uh, they always have a great time at that. But be sure and pick up your devotionals. They're out in the lobby, and I think there's some back of the back table. The devotionals are uh, free of charge, and they're wonderful, so pick yours up. Um, also, the cooking class that's coming up on uh, March 18th. That will be at 4 o'clock in the fellowship hall. And our evening service on Wednesday will be at 7. One thing on the men's breakfast, uh, guys, if you're, you're, if you're able to come, you will certainly be blessed because the biscuits and gravy and all that other stuff is really wonderful. <laughs> but to let you know, if you're in the church bulletin, you will get a phone call on Friday night as a reminder discussed it with pastor so he's in the church director he is going to start sending out that text or phone call message to you on friday evening to remind you of saturday morning how about that okay because i know you ladies never <laughs> forget anything so
turn in your hymnals to him 438. Jesus saves. The words will be on the screen. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth. Next hymn is 434, Revive Us Again. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for the spirit of light who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who hath borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Well, we are definitely pleased to have the Hesters with us. They sang this morning. They'll be singing tonight and next Sunday. And uh, please make them welcome. Well, I hope we don't wear you completely out. We're, we're, we'll be going home a couple of weeks. <laughs> so. Well, now, Pastor Dan is responsible for us singing tonight, and I know he didn't even have the nerve to show up. <laughs> So anyway, we'll just go right ahead anyway. When I think of Jesus' love And how he came from 
the hand of the Lord. On a busy thoroughfare, you can even find him there. Reach out, touch the hand of the Lord. Touch the hand that was nailed to a cruel tree. A hand that has power, yet so tender it can be. And when trouble assail you, his hand will never fail you. Reach out, touch the hand of the Lord. For that good song, appreciate those that message and music and so on. It kind of sounded funny when you said you're snowbirds and you're leaving here because in our case, the, the snowbirds come to us. You know, so it's like this isn't right. You got things backwards. But uh, so glad to be here again tonight and be able to speak to you, open God's word, and share some truths with you this evening. And uh, I wish. My son was able to be here, sorry that he's injured, but we know he's in good hands and both the Lords and the doctors and, and all you folks and appreciate your prayers for him. Appreciate, thank you, Mary and Alice and Norma. They took us to lunch today. We drove for seven and a half hours and went, <laughs> yeah, we went to Sierra Vista and ate down there and had a good meal and good time of fellowship and enjoyed that so much. And so thank you. I think some of them there, some of them are here. Where are you? There's one. Okay. Norma had to leave and Mary does not come in the evening. She told me she wouldn't be here tonight. And she said, you're a lousy preacher. I'm not coming back. <laughs> no, that's not true. But all right. And then I, I understand uh, pastor's made some arrangements for other meals, and they're going to be brought over there because he's not supposed to be up and around and so on, and I don't know who all's involved. I know you're involved because you, you're always involved in everything. Dan said you're responsible for most everything. Uh, yeah, trouble. But anyway, enough of all that. Uh, if you have your Bibles, First Kings chapter 20. 
1 Kings chapter 20. I spoke about missions this morning. I'm not going to do that tonight, although I suppose we could in some way find a way to apply it. But to 1 Kings chapter 20, by way of getting you up to speed and where we are in the chapter, the Israelites and the Syrians have gone to war, and the Israelites won. It was a battle that was, was fought in the mountainous region uh, of the area. And, uh, and so the king of Syria went back. He was very upset and so on because they lost the battle. And he wants to defeat King Ahab and the children of Israel. And he gets with his prophets and his people. And they, they, they told him uh, what we're going to read in tonight's uh, scripture. And then they had another battle and the children of Israel won again. But I want us to look, if you will, beginning at, at verse 22 in uh, 1 Kings 20. And the prophet came to the king of Israel and said unto him, Go, strengthen thyself, and mark and see what thou doest. For at the return of the year, the king of Syria will come up against thee. And the servants of the king of Syria said unto him, Their gods are gods of the hills. Therefore, they were stronger than we. But let us fight them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And do this thing, take the kings away, every man out of his place, and put captains in their rooms, and number thee an army like the um, army that thou hast lost, horse for horse, chariot for chariot, and we will fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And he hearkened unto their voice and did so. It came to pass at the return of the year that then had that numbered the Syrians and went up uh, into Aphek to fight against Israel. And the children of Israel were numbered and were all present and went against them. And the children of Israel pitched before them like two little flocks of kids. But the Syrians filled the country. And there came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said the Lord is a God of the hills, but he is not a God of the valleys, therefore will I deliver all this great multitude into thine hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Now the rest of the story we read, the battle raged, the Israelites won once again, ben had that went running, they captured him, and on, the, and on the battle goes, and so on and so forth. But I want you to notice in verse 23, and let me just kind of uh, paraphrase it, if you will. The king of Syria said, you have a God, but he's not much of a God. I mean, he's pretty strong up there in the hills, but I bet he's not too strong down in the valley. You get down here in the plain and fight us on level ground, and your God's not going to win. Look out. And he's, he's only strong in certain areas. In other areas, he's a pretty weak God, and we're aware of that. Now we found his weak spot, and you're going to pay for it. And so what the, what the king of Syria did, he accused the Lord of being weak in certain areas. And I apply that to certain areas of our life, if you will, tonight. And, but the Lord said in verse 28, he said, I'll show him. I'm not only the king, I'm not only God up on the mountain, I'm powerful in the valley too. And I'll show him. I, I think God's not like us, thank God. I mean, even though we were made in his image, you know, he's holy and he's perfect and so on. So this wasn't like a, a sarcastic, you know, uh, remark and so on where, well, I'll show him. You know, it was like he was speaking the truth. I'm God everywhere and I'm all powerful everywhere and my will gets done. So I want us to, to think about that. I'll make my prayer in just a minute. I mentioned this morning several years ago, Disney made a movie. And it was entitled, uh, entitled Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. And this pseudo uh, chemist and so on, whatever he was, uh, he's playing around with formulas and so on. All of a sudden, you know the story, boom. And he shrunk his kids down to such tiny spots that when they were out in the field, uh, that every blade of grass was a, a mortal weapon that could kill them. Every insect uh, was an enemy looming large enough that could destroy them. The, 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 the hose was an insurmountable wall for them to get over. And uh, because he'd made this mistake and, and he shrunk the kids. So I want us to kind of reverse that a little bit. And I want to say this tonight and, and kind of change that title as I mentioned this morning. Honey, I shrunk the Lord. Yeah, you know, he didn't shrink us. Honey, I shrunk the Lord. And, and what that amounts to is this. It, it causes us to not allow the Lord to be as big and as powerful and in control of every area of our life. We kind of com compartmentalize like the king of Syria did and say, God's powerful in this area, but he's not in this area. God can take care of me here, but God can't take care of me there. And what we effectively have done is we shrunk the Lord. 
Now, please understand, I know it's impossible. I, I know. I'm just using the pastoral imagination and liberty to, to, to pr prove a point here. See, we as Christians have many areas in our life in which we're victorious. Praise God. We also have some areas in which we aren't, unfortunately. And, and, and God's up there saying, hey, I can help you through that area too if you'd let me. I'm big enough to take care of that too. No matter how big your problem and how many, no many you have, how many you have, I, I'm there. I'm God. Trust me. It'll be okay. And so, in essence, sometimes we look at an area in our life that we're going through or, or something we don't understand or a problem or maybe somebody we're witnessing to that's just too hard-headed to accept the gospel. And we just, we, we kind of get to the point where we think God's not in this or, or God's doesn't care, or uh, maybe, maybe God just can't do this. And I, I know we don't believe that, but Satan lets us think that. And the longer we think it, the more real it becomes in our life. So I want to think tonight real quickly some thoughts along this, this line. Let's, let's make our prayer. Lord, teach us now as we look at your word and we understand the truth uh, uh, of the fact that as Christians, although we know you're all powerful, can do all things, sometimes we just kind of in our actions, our thoughts, our attitudes, our desires, our prayers, we, we shrink you down a little bit and, uh, and, and, and hinder you from doing all that that you can do and would do and want to do in our lives. Forgive us for that and help us to learn to overcome that and defeat Satan in our life as he uses us against us. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now, let me give you two or three quick thoughts along how do you shrink the Lord? I mean, it's not he all-powerful. Isn't he omnipotent, omniscient? Uh, eternal, unchanging, all those big theologians. He's God. I mean, he's God. And yet in our life sometimes we, we make him a little bit more diminutive than he is. A little smaller, right? We shrink him. You know, like that scientist that made a mistake and his kids were endangered. Well, we make this mistake. God's not endangered. We are. Let me give you number one. We shrink the Lord when we do not grow. Because your crises have grown. And when they're growing. Now, let me explain that. Too many of us. I grew up in Sunday school. I, I, I was born on, on a, a Sunday. The next Sunday, I was in Sunday school. My mom saved the bulletin. I was the youngest baby to ever be in the nursery at that time in that church. I grew up in Sunday school. And, and by the time I was 8 and 9 and 10, I knew all the stories uh, and so on. I, and, but, and many of you probably grew up in Sunday school too, and, and we know children who did. But so, too many of us operate on a, a Sunday school concept of God. Okay, here's the story. We, we go to Sunday school, and we were, learn some wonderful, marvelous, almost unbelievable truths about God. And, but but we're, we're children, and we're small, and we're young. And, and, and our world was small, but our God was big. And we're learning these things as children and say, wow, but I don't have all the problems. I don't have all the burdens, and I don't have all the stress. Mom and dad are taking care of everything, okay? All of a sudden, it's not long until my crisis is getting bigger. But I'm still operating on my Sunday school mentality of life and God. And suddenly, I'm looking at a burden, a problem, a crisis I never had as a child, and it throws me into a tizzy because I said, where's God? And God says, I'm right where I always was. Just trust me. Just think about that. You see, as cool as kids, we learn the lessons, the stories, and we believe them, and they were wonderful and marvelous. But guess what? We weren't facing them. We weren't facing them. I didn't have that burden. I have to worry about that. That's a wonderful story. I don't know what mom and dad are going through. I'm a kid. I don't care. I'm enjoying life. All of a sudden, I'm a teenager, and I'm an adult, and so on, and life changes. So if I don't grow in Christ as my problems grow, I am effectively shrinking God. Because as an 8-year-old, God was everything, and nothing could overcome me. But as an adult, all of a sudden, I don't think I can climb that mountain. I don't think I can get through that valley. 
I don't think I can overcome that burden. I don't think I can defeat that temptation. So as we've gotten older, we've had to deal with different things. All of a sudden, I have a financial problem. I didn't have that as a, co- a kid, but now I do. Where's God? Same God that supplied my needs when I was a kid, though I didn't know that he was and how he did, is supplying them today. We have a physical problem, uh, you know, a marital problem, a relational problem, an employment problem. We didn't have those because we were kids. We've grown up. And effectively, we shrink the Lord because we haven't grown in Christ as much as our problems have grown. And suddenly we have dashed hopes. And suddenly the devil gets in our mind and says, I told you, it's not real. You can't survive that. So you need to ask yourself. You, you, you don't have to ask yourself. You know this. Your crisis is, crisis is, 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 they've grown. But has your Christ? Has your relationship with Christ? Has your knowledge of Christ? Has your faith in Christ grown? Because every day I'm going to face a new or an additional or a bigger problem or burden. And I need to know my God's big enough. And so the devil throws those things right in our, in our face and we fail. We shrink the Lord because we don't grow in the Lord as the world around us and our problems and our burdens grow. So, yeah, I, I don't want to be a harbinger of bad news. But this is a saying I've been saying for a long, long time about life. You're either in a valley, coming out of a valley, or headed toward a valley. You're either, you're either fighting a battle, just won a battle, or there's one coming. That's life. So I need to grow because I've had enough faith to get through yesterday's battle. But my faith doesn't grow when tomorrow's comes. I may not be ready for it, and I'll be defeated. Number two, we shrink the Lord when we see the Bible as past history instead of present help. Okay? Think about that. Let me explain. We know and we believe the Bible is accurate. Scientists have learned if it's in the Bible, it's right, and they're wrong. Amazing facts about science, okay? It's accurate. It's accurate about history. I love it when some archaeologists find something and it proves the Bible, and they go, oh. I said, well, I didn't need you to find that. I already knew it was right. You know, and, and, and the Bible is accurate about medical things. You know, the life is in the blood and all these things. All right? But if we only see the Bible as an accurate book, it's not going to meet our needs when we, when we have fa- burdens to face and trials to bear, you see. If, if, if it becomes only a history book to us. I love history. I told Dan, I couldn't wait to get out here. I want to see some of this historical stuff. And I just got to stay home and have to find it on myself. You know, it's out there. I'll find it. If I get lost, give me your cell phone. I'll call you. Come find me. But uh, I love history. But you know what? I can pick up any book in an American library. Do they still have libraries in America? Oh, I don't have to just Google it. Okay. So, and I can read that, and it's not going to help me a whole lot when I get the notice from the bank that I've overdrawn. Or when I get the notice from the doctor says, you know that mass we found on your lung? It's cancer. Well, I read a book, and George Washington went across the Delaware after he threw that dollar, and he won that great battle. Well, hoop de do. I got cancer. You know what I'm saying? I don't have cancer. Don't you go out here and say that. I'm just making an illustration, okay? <laughs> I, I, I Believe it or not, I've had people, I've said something, and they go out, and I say, I was just trying to prove a point. Come on, give me a break. Uh, The Bible teaches us about an unchanging God, okay? But it's not a book about Abraham, the father of faith. It's not about a, a book about Job, who endured those trials and had great patience. It's not a a book about the Apostle Paul who started churches all across Asia and Europe and and Asia Minor. It's not about Moses at the Red Sea and and parting it. 
It's about the God who enabled them to do all those things. And so I, I need to look at the, the Bible as more than just a book that tells us how it was, but a book who can tell me how it can still be. And the God who did that is still active today. You see, the situations may vary, but God doesn't change. I read the Bible, okay? And here's these fishermen, the disciples of the Lord, and he tells them, get in the boat and go to the other side. And they get out there, and this great storm arises, and they're scared to death, and they're going to die and all this stuff. And they wake Jesus up and say, don't you care? He says, give me a break. I was taking a nap. And he stands up, and if you know the original Greek, you know, this is what he said. He looked at the wind and the waves and said, shut up. I'm taking a nap. He, King James Version says, peace be still. I, to my best knowledge, and probably to my best desire, will never be on a raging storm on the Sea of Galilee. I don't need Jesus to stand up and calm the Sea of Galilee for me. But, if I was, he would. But I have situations. I have problems. I have burdens. See, I will have storms in my life. You will have storms in your life. People have them in their marriages, in their families, in their jobs, in their health, in their finances. In there, in there, in there, in there. In there. You can fill in the blank forever. And I got to realize that that Bible that I'm trusting is alive today and is relevant today and it's true today. And the God that wrote it is active and, 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 and vibrant and anxious to help me and meet my needs. I, I, can, I can read those things, but I have to believe the God that did all that is still working in my life. And when I only see the book as a book that tells me how it was, I'm shrinking God. I'm hindering his ability to be big in my life. And I believe he'll be as big in our life as we allow him to be because he's God. Uh, we, we, we just shrink the Lord by failing to grow in grace and faith. We shrink the Lord by looking at the Bible as just a book. I don't mind calling the book. I, I have a saying I say at church all the time, stay in the book. But everybody knows that's capital B, and that's the holy book. That's the Bible, okay? So let me give you a third thing. And we've been talking about the problems and burdens of life. We shrink the Lord by gazing upon our problem and just, just glancing at the Lord. Gazing upon our problem, just glancing at the Lord, okay? Situation. Show you a physical explanation of that. You're driving down the highway. And you see a, a, a billboard up there, and it's got a message, and you're gazing it as it, you're driving. You just glance to, to make sure you're in the right lane. And the policeman said, why would you go off the road? Well, I was reading the billboard, okay, by glancing. In other words, spending more time seeing the problem than the Lord. And I shrink him in my life. And we're not prayerful. We make so much of our problem that we leave God out of it. All of a sudden, that's all we see, all we think about, all that we know. And we probably all know somebody. And we almost uh, hate to be around them because all they do is complain about their problem, about their burden, about their need. Never a happy thought, never a joyful thought, never an unselfish thought. It's all about me. And we, we see them coming. We want to go the other way, right? And, you know, all they do is focus on that negative. And we say, well, I know a person like that. Well, we may not be to that degree. But when I'm focusing on my problem instead of my God, I'm limiting his power in my life. I'm shrinking him down to my size, a size I can handle, a size that Satan wants me to expect and, and to believe and to think about that's all that God is. He's just a God. He'll, he'll take care of you up there, but he can't do it down there. Think about that, if you will. It's just time for us, as big and, and powerful as our problems are, to turn them over to the Lord. Yeah. Lord, this more than I can handle, but I know you can. Lord, I don't like this, but I'm enduring it because 
you're going through that valley with me. You know, we need to focus our sights on God instead of our problem. How big is your God? Veggie Tales. Remember the Veggie Tales? They all came out. They had those, those wonderful songs. One of my favorite songs was, God is bigger than the boogeyman. Bigger than Godzilla and the monsters on TV. God is bigger than the boogeyman. And he's taking care of me. How big is your God? You know, why don't we just factor him in? That's what the victories in the Bible are all about. This, men, this morning, David claimed the power of God and beat, the, and beat Goliath. You know, think about it. And, and Moses claimed the power of God and the Red Sea was parted. Joshua claimed the power of God and the walls of Jericho came down. Gideon claimed the power of God and the Moabites were defeated. And on and on the stories go. Factor God in. It's as simple as that. And yet it's as deep and hard and difficult as that because we live in this body of flesh. And I see the negative and I see the, 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 the problems and the inner man of God is seeing the victories and the power of God and it's a struggle and it's a battle. And sometimes I lose. See, we need to just grow in God. Otherwise, he's being shrunk in our life. Now, I want to real quickly to make this practical. I want to give you three or four thoughts that you can do that will help keep you from shrinking God in your life. Number one is going to kind of sing, sound a little bit silly. Let me give this to you. Sing the songs of faith. Sing the songs. It may sound silly, but it's powerful. I mean, think about this. You're out in the world all week long. You're not hearing God glorified. You're not hearing God praise. You're, you're hearing foul language and, 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 and filthy talk and hate and, and, and judgment and criticism and all that stuff. You, you, you get kicked around and you see all this meanness and, and, and you're just getting pushed down and down and down. And then Sunday comes and you come to church. Now, sad to say, for the most part, most of us when we get to church on Sunday after the week we've just had are not 100% tuned in to hear from God. We're just not quite ready. But all of a sudden, the music starts. And we start singing the great songs of faith and the hymns and, and the choruses. And, and God starts stirring something in our soul. And we're getting warmed up and we're getting in tune. And all of a sudden, it's a whole lot more real to us. And all of a sudden, we're a whole lot more close to God and honoring God than we were 15, 20, 30 minutes ago. Sing the songs. Now, I used to get aggravated, and I'd look out over my congregation and see somebody during the, during the hymn time. <laughs> I can't sing. Well, open your mouth and make a joyful noise. But I have a throat problem. I have a voice problem. It's to God that I'm in my third service of the day, and I'm still talking. With all the talking I've done since I got to Arizona. And at lunchtime, okay? So I have basically given up singing. My throat doctor told my voice doctor, said, don't sing. Your, vo your vocal cord, I have one. The other one's paralyzed. You, that's why you lose your voice. Don't sing. Tell me not to yell. That's your Baptist preacher not yelling. <laughs> Going to your kid's baseball and basketball game and not yelling. And you ever notice... You're at the farthest spot away from the house, and your wife wants something. And she yells, and she can. And then she wonders why I don't answer. And when I'm good and ready, 20 minutes later, I come all the way back across the house. And I can't answer you. I'm at the other side of the house. What do you want? And she says, I forgot. <laughs> but sing the songs and sing them all week long. I mean, a lot of times I'm just mouthing. I'll turn the cassette on. I don't have a cassette player. Who has a cassette player? I'll turn the CD on or the Bluetooth, and I'm singing in my heart. And sometimes I actually start singing a little bit and waving my hands while I'm driving. People go by and say, look at that lunatic. I don't care. God and me got a thing going. Sing the songs. 
Number two, spend time in prayer. And this is so basic. James said, you know, you have not because you ask not. James said, when you do ask, you ask amiss. Just spend time in prayer. Jesus said, ask and ye shall receive. All through the Bible, we're taught to pray. Well, if I pray, even my as difficult and complicated as my life is and becomes and becomes more so, prayer sees me through. I, I don't know how it works. I don't understand it. There's a God in heaven I've never seen. He's never audibly spoken to me. I read his book. I believe what it says. I talk to him, and he takes care of me. It's amazing, but it's great. You know, spend time daily with him in prayer. See, I want him to be big in my life, in every area, in every issue. I want him to, big in the, I want him to be big in the small issues because not every problem is overwhelming and life-threatening. But I want him to be big in those two. Here's a third thing. Meditate upon the greatness of God. We don't serve a God who's powerful in some areas and weak in others. We serve the almighty God of glory, the creator of all things, the sustainer of this universe. Meditate upon that. I got a big problem. I've got a bigger God. I got a big worry. I got a bigger God. I got a big question. I got a great big question answerer. I mean, meditate upon that. Spend time thinking about how big, how great, how good God is. Because when you wake up tomorrow, there's going to be a problem waiting at your door. You open that door, and he comes. You got to face him. It's okay. I've been, some spend time, I've been spending some time with my father. You don't frighten me. Everything's okay now. God's in control. The more you think about the greatness of God, the smaller your problems become and the bigger your problem, or your, your God becomes. You know, the more you think about God, the more he will increase in your life. And, I, you know, I want you to understand this, too, if you'll just think about that. Uh, when they come and the burdens come and the problems come, God's still in control. So here's the fourth thing and the last thing, obey him. Obey him. He knows what's going on. He knows what we need. He knows how to solve the problem. He knows my lack of faith or my growing. He knows all that. So just obey him. Jesus said, if you do these things, you'll know these things. We get it backwards. We want to know everything, then do it. He says, you do it, then you'll see what I'm going to do. Just obey him. Just obey him. Uh, you know, and I got to think about this, and, and I'm going to wrap this all up. God is so big, he does not have to use any qualifying words. So what are you talking about? Whosoever will may come. Not whosoever is smart, whosoever is rich, whosoever sins less. God says, I'm so big, I will save anybody who comes to me. That's a pretty big God. Peter wrote, casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. God's so big, he didn't say, I, only a few because I can't take that much. All your cares. And if there's seven and a half billion people in the world today, and we all cast our cares on him at the very same time, he's big enough to handle them all, and it will not in one iota make him any smaller or weaker. Thank God for that. You know, he said this, ask and you shall receive. He's big enough to say, I can answer your prayers. No matter how many times you pray and how, many time, and how big your prayers are. Don't Shrink the Lord. Build him up in your life. The devil wants him to be uh, made smaller every day so he can win the battle. I'll lose. God won't get the glory and so on. Well, let's just kick the devil in the teeth and realize how big our God is. Why don't you think about this? And, you know, God, God is not like the, the Syrian king said, a God only great in the, in the mountain and not in the valley. 
Think about this. He's great. Uh, there was a song came out. The God of the mountains uh, is a God. The God of the valleys is still God in the mountains, or however it went. Yeah, you sing that, Hester's. The God of the. I wish you had. Yeah, great song. Our God is the God of youth. I'm kind of happy he's also the God of old age. <laughs> Our God is the God of experience, but he's also the God of inexperience. Our God is the God of much faith, and he's also a great God when we have little faith. I mean, yeah, think about it. He's God when I have good health or when I have ill health. He's God when my bank account is full. I don't think I would know what that feels like. Or when it's empty, which I understand. He's God. He's the God of time. And you know what? One of these days, he'll still be God when there is no more time. He's God. He's God. How great is your God? How big is your God? God. He is bigger, larger, more wonderful, more marvelous, more every wonderful adjective that you can think of than your wildest imagination. He's God. He's God. How big is your God? I'm glad that he's big enough to save lost souls. I'm glad he's big enough to keep us saved after we trust him. I'm glad he's big enough to promise us a home in heaven for all of eternity. I'm glad that he's big enough that to meet my need on my journey from here to there. I'm glad he's my God. And he's not a God who's only big in some areas. He's God. He's God. You know, if you've shrunk the Lord today, you need to spend some time with him and say, Lord, let me get you back up to the size you ought to be in my life and in my mind and in my faith and in my thought process, and in my actions, and in my attitude. Honey, I shrunk the, the Lord. But I'm going to bring him back to size in my life by getting in the book and singing the songs and trusting God and obeying God and, 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 and fulfilling the truths and claiming him by faith. How big is your God? He's big enough. Father in heaven, Speak to us now. Help us understand just how big a God we serve, how wonderful you are, how gracious and kind you are to us in all ways, at all times. Help us, I pray, to trust you more each day because you're God. And we should and we can and we're blessed when we do. And I'll thank you and praise you for it. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just stand together. We'll sing an invitation hymn. As we're doing that, I don't expect you to flood the altars tonight, but I do expect you and would like you and plead with you to do some business with God. Ask God to be big in your life once again and trust him accordingly. <laughs> you need someone to turn the video on? Oh, we got, we're singing the piano. I'm sorry, I, I end so, so abruptly, don't I? Change my heart, oh God. I think you picked a hymn I don't know. There's a chorus? I might after I hear it. And that's what we need to have done tonight because we've shrunk our God. We need our heart to be changed.
us not just to sing that, but to desire it and to allow you to do it. Change our heart. Grow in us daily and be the big God in our life that we know you are and want to be. And I'll thank you and praise you for that. I love you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night. God bless you. Shake hands before you leave. Remember to pray for your pastor that he will improve quickly. Amen. Thank you, sir. Amen. Lord bless